Hey there, uh, my name is Cab. I lead the software team at Day Zero Diagnostics, where we're working to change the way bacterial infections are diagnosed and treated by leveraging whole genome sequencing, machine learning, and software like Kubernetes to run bioinformatics tools at scale. Um, so today we're going to talk specifically about a bioinformatics tool called Kraken, uh, which was developed in an academic research environment. So it was developed at Johns Hopkins um, to solve some really complex and specialized problems, um, but wasn't necessarily designed for scale. Um, so here's where we're headed today. Um, we're first going to lay some really basic groundwork around microbiology and sequencing data. Um, then we're going to talk about Kraken, both the complex technical problem Kraken is trying to solve and why Kraken is tough to scale. Um, and finally, we'll discuss leveraging Kubernetes, leveraging modern infrastructure to run Kraken at scale, um, which leads us into our primary takeaway, I hope, for this talk. Um, and it's not a technical takeaway. It's the recognition that some of our most complex and important scientific and healthcare problems which require specialized scientific expertise are going to necessitate researchers and engineers working together to not only solve the problem, but find ways to solve these tough problems uh, at scale. And I feel pretty confident saying that this is more important now than ever. Um, on the engineering side, especially in this community here at KubeCon, which is focused on modern scalable infrastructure, uh, I think we should reflect on whether we're holding, uh, holding up our end of that bargain. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into it. Um, for a long time, the process of uh, diagnosing and prescribing antibiotics to treat bacterial infections has been to actually grow the pathogenic bacteria in culture and perform tests on that grown bacteria to determine what bacteria is causing an infection and which antibiotics the bacteria is susceptible to or resistant to. And one of the main issues with this is growing bacteria, literally feeding them and having them proliferate and then testing them is not a very fast process. So this generally takes two, three, four days to complete. Uh, and during that time, prior to having diagnostic information, uh, physicians are forced to treat patients with bacterial infe infections with broad spectrum antibiotics. So this is sort of like carpet bombing to just uh, hope that one of the antibiotics that uh, you provide, um, uh, this bacteria is um, uh, susceptible to. Um, not only is this toxic for the patient, um, but contributes to faster proliferation of antibiotic resistant bacteria. However, it is now technically possible and economically feasible to instead sequence the DNA of the pathogenic bacteria and use that sequencing data along with bioinformatics software and machine learning to try to identify the organism causing an infection and determine what antibiotics that bacteria is susceptible to. And for us at day zero, one of the technologies we use to do that is an Oxford nanopore minion sequencer, which looks a little bit like this over here. Um, it starts at $1,000 and can produce a pretty significant amount of sequencing data um, in a few hours. Uh, so yeah, that's our, that's our uh, microbiology state of the union. So now let's talk a little bit about the data um, that comes off of this sequencer. So what we get out of uh, this MinION sequencer is for each sample sequenced, a file that's somewhere between 500 megabytes and two gigabytes compressed. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. Uh, it contains repeated sets of groupings called reads that each contain an identifier, uh, a sequence, which is just a long sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's, our four DNA bases, and a couple of lines about the quality of those bases. Uh, and a single sequencing data file will contain tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of reads, um, generally totaling somewhere between 100 million and 2 billion bases, depending on how long uh, a sample is sequenced. And just for reference, that uh, little minion sequencer we looked at on the last slide uh, can sequence over 90 samples concurrently on that one uh, small device. Um, 
So each read here um, that's in the sequencing data uh, represents a small section of the genome of the organism that was sequenced. Um, the reads that uh, are part of that sequencing data aren't necessarily in any order. Uh, they might be overlapping, they may be duplicates, um, and they generally uh, vary in length. Um, and if this sounds like a hard enough problem to figure out um, where these reads uh, should be uh, aligned to the organism's genome that you put into the sequencer, uh, it gets much, much harder when you don't know what you put into the sequencer. Um, so if you don't know the organism that was sequenced, you really have very little information to work off of uh, to make any sense of these reads. It's sort of like, like having a 100,000 piece puzzle made up of only four colors and we have no clue what the final assembled puzzle looks like. Um, so they're dedicated specialists thinking about how to effectively and correctly put this massive puzzle um, together. Um, these are the computational biologists and the bioinformaticians, uh, and they've produced an entire ecosystem of tooling to try to take these reads with very little information and turn them into something meaningful. And one of the tools that's part of that ecosystem is called Kraken, which is a taxonomic sequence classifier. Um, so Kraken takes reads and tries to determine what species genome a given read sequence belongs to. So given a sequencing data file, like this one in the bottom right, uh, Kraken will say like this read belongs to this weird species and that read belongs to this other weird species um, all the way down uh, the file. And in a nutshell, for each sequence of bases or read uh, that Kraken receives, it looks at all of the subsequences, which are comprised of 31 bases. And from there tries to determine all of the bacterial species whose genome contains each specific subsequence. Um, after doing that, for every subsequence in the larger read, it classifies the read as belonging to the species that was assigned the largest percentage of subsequences. Um, so the entire read um, uh, gets called as the species that got the most of these 31 base um, subsequences. And the actual process data structures are uh, quite a bit more complicated than this, but um, even just this probably uh, you guess is a pretty computationally intensive um, process. But on top of that, um, Kraken requires a reference database to compare each subsequence against. Um, and that Kraken database can vary in size based on the number of organisms you want to classify and, and how confident you want to be in your classification. And so our database at day zero contains primarily the bacteria um, we're most interested in um, and comes to 350 gigs um, in total size. And that entire database is loaded into memory at runtime um, of Kraken, which in general is achieved using a RAM back disk, um, which allows us to keep the database in memory over multiple executions of the Kraken command line tool. Um, so once that 350 gig database is loaded into memory, um, Kraken might take anywhere from a few seconds to 10, 20 minutes to classify all the reads in a sequencing file. Um, just based on the size of the amount of data that's given to Kraken and um, somewhat based on the complexity of the data given to Kraken. So at this point, we've identified a complex and important problem and talked through the specialized scientific expertise, both in sequencing data and tooling required to begin to attack this problem. Uh, so now we can start to talk about uh, how we might also try to attack this problem at scale um, and how we might leverage Kubernetes to do that. So at day zero, we're currently a software team of four um, working alongside computational biologists and bioinformaticians uh, to reduce the computational turnaround time for bacterial species identification and antibiotic resistance profiling um, to less than an hour. Um, 
And so uh, we want to not only be able to produce meaningful data um, in less than an hour based on input sequence data, but we want to be able to do this um, on lots of sequence data um, in parallel. And that's really a change from the early development at day zero, which was research oriented bioinformatics pipelines um, that were uh, didn't need to focus on scale. And so we're uh, focused mostly on the scientific, um, this solving this complex scientific problem, which is a hard enough problem in itself. Um, and so bioinformatics uh, workloads in, in a research environment at day zero would generally run with process level parallelism on, on standalone large uh, virtual machines. Um, but as we needed to scale, considering our small engineering team, um, this is a great opportunity to leverage Kubernetes generally. And, and for these bioinformatics uh, pipelines, um, we could leverage Kubernetes jobs, um, which give us dedicated, repeatable environments. Each pipeline is decoupled from all other pipelines um, and uh, gives us uh, obviously improved reliability with um, uh, pretty limited engineering investment. Um, but uh, on top of that, we knew that um, if we want to leverage Kraken um, among the bioinformatics tools that we're going to use in these bioinformatics pipelines, uh, we've clearly got a problem. Um, each pod that we want to run Kraken in would require 350 gigs of RAM. Um, and we're at day zero, where we're looking to run 50, 100, 200 bioinformatics workloads in parallel. Um, uh, this is just not, um, not feasible um, to uh, expect us to be able to um, deal with this large memory footprint um, at really any scale at all. So instead, um, we can centralize Kraken to control the parallelism of our Kraken service separate from the parallelism of our primary bioinformatics workloads. Um, and again, this allows us alongside our Kubernetes jobs that are running our bioinformatics pipelines and other bioinformatics tools, um, we can stand up uh, our Kraken API. Um, so we can put together a Kraken deployment um, uh, that runs our API and stand up uh, a Kubernetes service easily in front of it um, and uh, from our primary uh, bioinformatics pipelines, um, just make, make requests directly uh, to our service. Um, and on top of that, um, you, we can leverage Kubernetes and, um, to support uh, a cost-effective way um, to manage Kraken by um, running our Kraken API on uh, a node pool made up of large preemptible nodes to support this, this large memory footprint uh, required by Kraken. And so this is great. This allows us to uh, support um, uh, our bioinformatics pipelines um, at some scale and run Kraken at some scale. Um, on top of that, we can take a step up uh, a level and Kubernetes allows still our small engineering team to support an even more complex um, system um, that uh, allows us to provide a variety of Kraken workloads and uh, use cases. Um, so we do things like um, utilize CADA um, uh, to add redundancy to our Kraken deployment during work days when most active sequencing is happening. And so we uh, have a preemptible node that provides uh, maybe a single replica um, generally of our uh, Kraken API, um, but can be preempted at any time um, uh, and take some time to come back up. And in addition, during the day, we can spin up a non preemptible um, uh, second replica of our Kraken API um, that gives us a little bit more uh, reliability when sequencing is more likely to happen. Um, additionally, uh, we can deploy a second Kraken service alongside our original deployment with a database that contains fewer species uh, for cases where we wanna prioritize speed over accuracy. Um, so this starts to become 
um, a pretty uh, complex uh, system um, that supports lots of use cases and some dynamic use cases, um, but is still possible um, for a pretty small um, engineering team. Although it does require, I think, when we get to this system, we get probably beyond um, to the place where uh, having engineering expertise work with the bioinformatics group and the computational biologist um, uh, becomes uh, critical to um, supporting these more complex uh, systems. Um, and then on top of that, um, if there are use cases uh, where um, we need to have repeatable, movable, um, larger systems, we can step up another level and uh, leverage Helm, for example, to support um, non-HIPAA compliant and HIPAA compliant workspaces that include our bioinformatics pipelines, our tracking deployments, include uh, uh, tooling that comes alongside that, um, like CADA and Prometheus. And so um, uh, with some engineering support, um, working alongside um, the research side, we can, we can move to where we can support pretty complex systems in real world use cases um, uh, at some scale. Um, and, and the value that uh, Helm and Kubernetes, Cata, Prometheus provide um, to this scientific problem um, is pretty, pretty massive. Um, and that's not to say that uh, I, I think, you know, as we know, leveraging Kubernetes uh, for these scalability benefits does come with some trade-offs um, where having engineering expertise um, uh, uh, contributing to this scientific application is critical. And so outside of the sort of standard normal Kubernetes complexities. Um, this, you know, Kraken itself um, uh, has sort of some edge use cases of, of Kubernetes features. So we leverage an init container to load the 350 gig Kraken database into a uh, memory um, medium empty deer um, prior to the API becoming available. And so um, we have to deal with some features that may be uh, a little less mature and uh, a little um, non-standard and sort out how we're dealing with, um, can effectively deal with some of these edge case features of Kubernetes, um, which is where um, uh, engineering expertise um, uh, provides, uh, I guess, where the engineering side will have to provide input and provide expertise um, to uh, the bioinformatics informatics and computational biology side. Um, so that's, I'll say that, um, you know, software like Kubernetes, like Helm, like Kata, Prometheus working together provide pretty massive value uh, for solving these types um, of uh, uh, difficult problems in real world scenarios. And Kraken is a complex software. So, you know, our our team is not going to reach into that database for performance improvement. Um, it's excuse me into that code base for performance improvements. Um, and instead, um, scalable infrastructure is a really powerful um, option for uh, us to um, uh, work together uh, with um, our research side um, to solve some of these problems at scale. Um, so that brings us back to. Uh, the, hopefully the take home once more, which is that these really hard but really important problems um, are going to require academic researchers and engineers uh, working together. And I think in looking at the KubeCon 2020 uh, schedule, we have to, you know, we should reflect on, um, you know, whether we're making a large enough contribution on the engineering side. Um, I think for me, like I could only find sort of one talk that I thought fell into this uh, category. That was this 
um, this what sounds like super interesting talk about um, Kubernetes contribution to research around um, uh, the, uh, the epidemic and um, by Chris Nova and Dr. Beta. And so um, I hope that, you know, in the future um, and future KubeCons, um, uh, in, in the future, we have the uh, opportunity to um, see more talks like this at future KubeCons, um, talks that highlight this community contributing to uh, scientific research uh, and healthcare. So um, if you haven't already, please go see this talk because I'm sure it's gonna be great. And um, I encourage you to support talks, projects, initiatives that apply best in class um, infrastructure solutions um, to scientific research uh, and healthcare. Um, and just in general, um, I think, uh, yeah, that, that we should continue to make a concerted effort to be as welcoming as possible to other communities with non-engineering expertise that would get huge value by leveraging software like Kubernetes to try to solve some of the problems they're trying to solve. Um, and if you're interested in Kraken in the intersection of research software, um, software like Kubernetes, um, or just interested in some of the stuff we're working on at day zero, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I've also added two of our engineers from day zero here, Zach and Tim, and they are um, uh, two, of, uh, two of the engineers that are working daily uh, on some of these uh, complex and specialized problems and how um, we can apply um, scalable engineering principles um, uh, to our research uh, to solve these problems. So I think if you have questions about uh, this, these uh, um, Zach and Tim uh, are the, the folks to connect with. Um, otherwise, thanks so much.